Chapter Thirty Six of the Old Curiosity Shop. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Six. As the single gentleman, after some weeks' occupation of his lodgings, still declined to correspond by word or gesture, either with Mister Brass or his sister Sally, but invariably chose Richard Swiveller as his channel of communication and as he proved himself in all respects a highly desirable inmate, paying for everything beforehand, giving very little trouble, making no noise, and keeping early hours, Mr. Richard imperceptibly rose to an important position in the family, as one who had influence over this mysterious lodger, and could negotiate with him, for good or evil, when nobody else durst approach his person. If the truth must be told, even Mr. Swiveller's approaches to the single gentleman were of a very distant kind, and met with small encouragement. But, as he never returned from a monosyllabic conference with the unknown, without quoting such expressions as, Swiveller, I know I can rely upon you. I have no hesitation in saying, Swiveller, that I entertain a regard for you. Swiveller, you are my friend, and will stand by me, I am sure with many other short speeches of the same familiar and confiding kind, purporting to have been addressed by the single gentleman to himself, and to form the staple of their ordinary discourse. Neither Mr. Brass nor Miss Sally for a moment questioned the extent of his influence, but accorded to him their fullest and most unqualified belief. But quite apart from, and independent of, this source of popularity, Mr. Swiveller had another— which promised to be equally enduring, and to lighten his position considerably. He found favour in the eyes of Miss Sally Brass. Let not the light's corners of female fascination erect their ears to listen to a new tale of love, which shall serve them for a jest. For Miss Brass, however accurately formed to be beloved, was not of the loving kind. That amiable virgin, having clung to the skirts of the law from her earliest youth, having sustained herself by their aid, as it were, in her first running alone, and maintained a firm grasp upon them ever since, had passed her life in a kind of legal childhood. She had been remarkable, when a tender prattler for an uncommon talent in counterfeiting the walk and manner of a bailiff, in which character she had learned to tap her little playfellows on the shoulder, and to carry them off to imaginary sponging houses with a correctness of imitation which was the surprise and delight of all who witnessed her performances, and which was only to be exceeded by her exquisite manner of putting an execution into her doll's house, and taking an exact inventory of the chairs and tables. These artless sports had naturally soothed and cheered the decline of her widowed father, a most exemplary gentleman, called Old Foxy by his friends from his extreme sagacity who encouraged them to the utmost, and whose chief regret, on finding that he drew near to Houndsditch churchyard, was that his daughter could not take out an attorney's certificate and hold a place upon the roll. Filled with this affectionate and touching sorrow, he had solemnly confided her to his son Samson as an invaluable auxiliary, and from the old gentleman's decease to the period of which we read, Miss Sally Brass had been the prop and pillar of his business. It is obvious that, having devoted herself from infancy to this one pursuit and study, Miss Brass could know but little of the world, otherwise than in connection with the law, and that from a lady gifted with such high tastes, proficiency in those gentler and softer arts in which women usually excel, was scarcely to be looked for. Miss Sally's accomplishments were all of a masculine and strictly legal kind. They began with the practice of an attorney, and they ended with it. She was in a state of lawful innocence, so to speak. The law had been her nurse, and, as bandy legs or such physical deformities in children are held to be the consequence of bad nursing, so, if in a mind so beautiful any moral twist or handiness could be found, Miss Sally Brass's nurse was alone to blame. It was on this lady, then, that Mr. Swiveller burst in full freshness as something new, and hitherto undreamed of, lighting up the office with scraps of song and merriment, 
conjuring with inkstands and boxes of wafers, catching three oranges in one hand, balancing stools upon his chin and penknives on his nose, and constantly performing a hundred other feats with equal ingenuity. For with such unbendings did Richard, in Mr. Brass's absence, relieve the tedium of his confinement. These social qualities, which Miss Sally first discovered by accident, gradually made such an impression upon her, that she would entreat Mr. Swiveller to relax as though she were not by, which Mr. Swiveller, nothing loath, would readily consent to do. By these means a friendship sprang up between them. Mr. Swiveller gradually came to look upon her, as her brother Samson did, and as he would have looked upon any other clerk. He imparted to her the mystery of going the old man, or plain new market for fruit, ginger beer, baked potatoes, or even a modest venture, of which Miss Brass did not scruple to partake. He would often persuade her to undertake his share of writing in addition to her own. Nay, he would sometimes reward her with a hearty slap on the back, and protest that she was a devilish good fellow, a jolly dog, and so forth, all of which compliments Miss Sally would receive in entire good part, and with perfect satisfaction. One circumstance troubled Mr. Swiveller's mind very much, and that was that the small servant always remained somewhere in the bowels of the earth, under beaver's marks, and never came to the surface unless the single gentleman rang his bell, when she would answer it and immediately disappear again. She never went out, or came into the office, or had a clean face, or took off the coarse apron, or looked out of any one of the windows, or stood at the street door for a breath of air, or had any rest or enjoyment whatever. Nobody ever came to see her, nobody spoke of her, nobody cared about her. Mr. Brass had said once that he believed she was a love child, which means anything but a child of love, and that was all the information Richard Swiveller could obtain. "'It's of no use asking the dragon,' thought Dick one day, as he sat contemplating the features of Miss Sally Brass. I suspect if I asked any questions on that head, our alliance would be at an end. I wonder whether she is a dragon, by the by, or something in the mermaid way. She has rather a scaly appearance, but mermaids are fond of looking at themselves in the glass, which she can't be, and they have a habit of combing their hair, which she hasn't. No, she is a dragon. "'Where are you going, old fellow?' said Dick aloud, as Miss Sally wiped her pen as usual on the green dress, and uprose from her seat. "'To dinner,' answered the dragon. "'To dinner?' thought Dick. "'That's another circumstance. I don't believe that small servant ever has anything to eat.' "'Sammy won't be home,' said Miss Brass. "'Stop till I come back. I shan't be long.' Dick nodded and followed Miss Brass with his eyes to the door, and with his ears to a little back parlour, where she and her brother took their meals. Now, said Dick, walking up and down with his hands in his pockets, I'd give something, if I had it, to know how they use that child, and where they keep her. My mother must have been a very inquisitive woman. I have no doubt I'm marked with a note of interrogation somewhere. My feelings I smother, but thou hast been the cause of this anguish. My, upon my word, said Mr. Swiveller, checking himself and falling thoughtfully into the client's chair, I should like to know how they use her. After running on in this way for some time, Mr. Swiveller softly opened the office door, with the intention of darting across the street for a glass of the mild porter. At that moment he caught a parting glimpse of the brown head-dress of Miss Brass flitting down the kitchen stairs. And by Jove, thought Dick, she's going to feed the small servant, now or never. First peeping over the handrail and allowing the head-dress to disappear in the darkness below, he groped his way down and arrived at the door of a back kitchen immediately after Miss Brask had entered the same, bearing in her hand a cold leg of mutton. It was a very dark, miserable place, very low and very damp. The walls disfigured by a thousand rents and blotches. The water was trickling out of a leaky butt, and a most wretched cat was lapping up the drops with sickly eagerness of starvation. The grate, 
which was a wide one, was wound and screwed up tight, so as to hold no more than a little thin sandwich of fire. Everything was locked up. The coal cellar, the candle box, the salt box, the meat safe, were all padlocked. There was nothing that a beetle could have lunched upon. The pinched and meagre aspect of the place would have killed a chameleon. He would have known at the first mouthful that the air was not eatable and must have given up the ghost in despair. The small servant stood with humility in presence of Miss Sally and hung her head. "'Are you there?' said Miss Sally. "'Yes, ma'am,' was the answer in a weak voice. "'Go further away from the leg of mutton, or you'll be picking it, I know.' said Miss Sally. The girl withdrew into a corner, while Miss Brass took a key from her pocket, and, opening the safe, brought from it a dreary waste of cold potatoes, looking as eatable as Stonehenge. This she placed before the small servant, ordering her to sit down before it, and then, taking up a great carving-knife, made a mighty show of sharpening it upon the carving-fork. "'Do you see this?' said Miss Brass, slicing off about two square inches of cold mutton, after all this preparation and holding it out on the point of the fork. The small servant looked hard enough at it with her hungry eyes, to see every shred of it, small as it was, and answered, Yes. Then don't you ever go and say, retorted Miss Sally, that you hadn't meat here. There, eat it up. This was soon done. Now do you want any more? said Miss Sally. The hungry creature answered with a faint, No. They were evidently going through an established form. You've been helped once to meet, said Miss Brass, summing up the facts. You have had as much as you can eat. You're asked if you want any more, and you answer no. Then don't you ever go and say you were allowanced, mind that? With those words, Miss Sally put the meat away and locked the safe, and then drawing near to the small servant, overlooked her while she finished the potatoes. It was plain that some extraordinary grudge was working in Miss Brass's gentle breast, and that it was that which impelled her, without the smallest present cause, to wrap the child with the blade of the knife, now on her hand, now on her head, and now on her back, as if she found it quite impossible to stand so close to her without administering a few slight knocks. But Mr. Swiveller was not a little surprised to see his fellow clerk, after walking slowly backwards towards the door, as if she were trying to withdraw herself from the room but could not accomplish it, dart suddenly forward, and falling on the small servant give her some hard blows with her clenched hand. The victim cried, but in a subdued manner, as if she feared to raise her voice, and Miss Sally, comforting herself with a pinch of snuff, ascended the stairs just as Richard had safely reached the office. End of chapter 36